Good day. Welcome to Jang Amor's channel reserved for meaningful discussions. Today, I will be discussing hypothesis testing for my students in statistics in our second year since our classes were also affected by COVID-19. So enjoy and keep safe, everyone. This PowerPoint presentation was used in an MTAP our Mathematics Teachers Association in the Philippines Ilo Ilo chapter during one of its seminars. I cannot really take credit for this presentation and I'm only using this since I wasn't able to bring my statistics materials from school and I haven't visited the school since the lockdown. So let's get on with the discussion. I am splitting the video into two. The first one will cover the introduction to hypothesis testing and the first few steps. And the second one, we'll deal with some tests, Z-test, the T-test, and Z-test for proportions for hypothesis testing, which we will be only doing one sample cases since, again, I do not have my materials with me. As discussed previously, there are two areas of statistics, and I hope you are familiar with this one because we have already discussed it in class. So we have already dealt with descriptive statistics during your prelim and midterm exams since these are methods concerned with collecting, describing, analyzing a set of data without drawing conclusions or inferences about the large groups you simply describe. So from graphs and measures of central tendencies, variations, and dispersions. Second one. The inferential statistics are methods concerned with the analysis of a subset of data leading to predictions or inferences about the entire set of data. So we also assume that the sample always describes the general picture or the general population. In today's situations, we say that 54 people have recovered in the Philippines for those who are infected with COVID-19. So this is descriptive statistics. But when we say 80% of the people with COVID-19 who died are aged 60 and above, then conclude that senior citizens are more in danger to contract and die from the virus compared to other age groups. So this is now inferential statistics. Another example for descriptive statistics is the population of Filipino people when grouped according to age and sex. Another example of inferential statistics is when the sample babies displayed good motor skills when introduced a new milk formula. Then we generalize that all babies should drink this new formula milk. Generally, in doing inferential statistics, our sample should be a subset of the population. I hope you remember your sets from GE3 or our introduction during your prelims. Example, if the population is the working Filipino people affected by COVID-19, then the target sample should match this population. But this is a very broad population, so you can further simplify it. Frontliners working directly with COVID patients. So the nurses and doctors and other medical-related people in different fields. Or to displaced workers, so people who work in restaurants, malls, and other establishments that were locked down, or drivers and sidewalk vendors who cannot peddle their wares. Example for inferential statistics is using the list of those who were VIP tested in the Philippines for COVID-19, minus the president, since we cannot afford to be leaderless in these times, and the DOH secretary, since he should be the focal person for this crisis. Who will you most likely not vote next elections? Then, based on all my every friends or my survey, this is a biased sample, so not really suggested, will most likely not vote for Bong Revilla. Therefore, you conclude in general the Filipino people will not vote for Bong Revilla. There are two main methods of inferential statistics. So number one is estimation of parameters, which we have already discussed before COVID and hypothesis testing, which was mentioned and we should have discussed, but then there was a lockdown. So we will be discussing it in this video. In hypothesis testing, the most important parts are to identify the problem, formulate your hypothesis, identify the test statistics to use or the most, what test statistic is most appropriate for your problem, and of course, to conclude correctly. So we will discuss each in detail. So some examples of problems or research objectives are Number one, to compare the incidence of bullying at present with the incidence of bullying a decade ago. 
to determine if there is significant difference in the proportion of teenage pregnancy in rural areas and the proportion of teenage pregnancy in urban areas. To determine if there is significant relationship between the time spent in studying and the scores in the test of learners in Sara Central School. Example, Maria is saving part of her allowance every week. Last year, Maria was able to save on the average 55 pesos per week. This year, for five randomly selected weeks, Maria found that she was able to save an average of 40 pesos only. Maria was alarmed and suspected that she had saved significantly less. Is there enough reason for Maria to be worried? So the research objective for this problem is to determine if the average weekly savings of Maria for this year is less than last year's average weekly savings. So to state this as a statistical objective, to determine if there is a significant difference on the average weekly savings of Maria for this year compared to last year's average weekly savings. Now let's discuss the steps in hypothesis testing. There are six steps, though I included identifying the problem here as a step. So step one, you formulate the null and hy alternative hypothesis. We will be discussing this in detail. Step two, determine the appropriate test statistic, either t-test or z-test. You identify also the type of test as one-tailed or two-tailed. We'll be discussing this in detail. Step 3. Choose a significance level or your alpha. And of course, the sample size. We will be discussing this in detail. Step 4. Identify the sampling distribution and the critical region. Determine the degrees of freedom. If it is a t-test, we will be discussing this in detail. And step 5, compute for the test statistic, which we will discuss in the second video. And step 6, make a decision to reject your null hypothesis or not to reject your null hypothesis. Then you state your conclusion. Let's start with uh, step 1. Formulate the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So a hypothesis is a statement of belief used in the evaluation of population values. It is an assertion or conjecture concerning one or more populations. It is your assumption of what is true for the population. So what is being tested? The null hypothesis is a claim that your research result is the same as the population. So we say that there is no significant difference between the results of the Philippine COVID casualties and the world casualties. This is a null hypothesis. There is no significant relationship in deaths and prior medical history in COVID casualties. Then for alternative hypothesis, since this is a claim that is opposite your null hypothesis, so for the first one, there is significant difference in the Philippine COVID casualties and the world casualties. Or, there is a significant relationship between deaths and prior medical history on COVID cases. The null hypothesis is what is being tested. So there is no significant difference in the mean number of deaths from COVID in USA and Europe. So mean of A is equal to mean of B. The alternative hypothesis disagrees with the null hypothesis. So if we reject the null, the conclusion will always be the alternative hypothesis. So there is a significant difference in the mean number of deaths from COVID in USA and Europe. So mean of A is not equal to mean of B. The level of significance. We denote this by alpha and is interpreted as the probability that a true null hypothesis will be rejected. It is also the magnitude of error that one is willing to accept in making a decision to reject the null hypothesis. That's why, in medical research and other crucial tests, we use alpha equals 0.01 or lower. In rejecting or not rejecting the null hypothesis, we can commit two errors as shown in the table. Type 1 error is when the null hypothesis is true, that there is no significant difference between mean of A and mean of B, so meaning your null hypothesis is true, but we reject it anyway and claim that there is a difference. The type 2 error occurs when there is significant difference in mean of A and mean of B, so meaning your null hypothesis is false, and we do not reject it or we accept it as true. 
A good analogy for type 1 error. Sugar is a coffee sweetener. We know that this is true. You do not want sugar because black coffee is best. And then, the world claims that sugar is therefore not a coffee sweetener. A good analogy for type 2 error. Salt is a coffee sweetener. False. Unless you're that person with unusual ta taste or you're pregnant, but well, coffee and sugar should be bawal. Then you accepted the salt and had no complaints in the test. And the person who gave you salt claimed that salt is a coffee sweetener because you have no complaints. Get? Step 3. The order of is a bit different, but the parts are the same, so just plot along. So you identify the, reject the rejection region or the critical region. This is the area under the sampling distribution. Usually, we use the normal distribution that includes all unlikely outcomes. So those that will happen. Or this is the probability that the null hypothesis is false. The critical values are the boundaries between the acceptance region and the rejection region. If the test statistic result falls in the rejection region, the result is significant and the null hypothesis is rejected. Otherwise, the statistic result is not significant and the null hypothesis is not rejected or the null is accepted. The graph of the critical region for two-tailed tests shows the rejection areas on both ends of the curve. The critical values also on both ends of the curve and the acceptance region in the middle. So if it falls at the ends, then you reject the null hypothesis. But if the test statistic falls in the middle, so you do not reject the null hypothesis. Step 4. The test can either be two-tailed, so mean of A is not equal to mean of B, or one-tailed, mean of A is greater than B, or mean of A is less than mean of B. So you cannot have both less and greater. So kung mo lang man ang matabo, two-tailed lang gamiton mo. For two-tailed tests, null hypothesis is rejected when the test statistic falls within the critical region or rejection region on either both ends. For one-tailed test, depending if it's greater than or less than, then it will be rejected when the test statistic falls on the side identified as the rejection region. Some examples of how null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis depending if it's two-tailed or one-tailed. Two-tailed test. There is no significant difference in the mean number of deaths from COVID in USA and Europe for your null hypothesis. Then for alternative hypothesis, there is significant difference in the mean number of deaths from COVID in USA and Europe. And for one-tailed test, there is no significant difference in the mean number of deaths from COVID in USA and Europe. But for your alternative hypothesis, deaths from COVID in USA is significantly higher compared to Europe or the mean number of deaths from COVID in USA is significantly lower than those in Europe. Another example, two-tailed. Null hypothesis. There is no significant difference between the mean score of males and females and the mean score of females. H or null alternative hypothesis, HE. There is a significant difference between the mean score of males and the mean score of females. And for one-tailed test, HO, there is no significant difference between the mean scores of males and the mean scores of females. HA, the mean score of males is significantly higher than the mean score of females. So this, we end the discussion here. If you have any questions or clarifications, you post a comment. For the rest of the steps and the examples, you click on the link below to go to part 2.